Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad to have you with us tonight for another WNP online program. This one's Fort Point from Army Post to Historic Site with John Martini. I'm Nicole Meldahl. I'm Executive Director of Western Neighborhoods Project, and I will be your flight attendant for the evening. So please let me know if there's anything I can get you. And we're so excited to all be here tonight. But before we really get into the good stuff, I'd like to introduce you to who we are as an organization, if you don't already know. So we are Western Neighborhoods Project, a 501c3 California nonprofit that has preserved, interpreted, and shared the diverse history and culture of San Francisco's West Side since 1999. And if you go to our website and sign up for our monthly email, you can stay in the know about all the fun things we do, like our weekly podcast, Outside Land San Francisco, events like this, as well as history walks and pub crawls. We have articles, videos, and so much more. And in support of this work, we launched the OpenSF History Program in 2014 to digitize and make accessible thousands of historical images that reach citywide. And you can peruse our archive at opensfhistory.org by map, by key term search, or by recent updates. It's truly a choose your own adventures. And speaking of adventures, um, we are a lovable branding nightmare. So sometimes it's a journey to find us across the internet, but here we are on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Eventbrite, where you can follow us to be notified the second we drop the next public program. And we do our best to make sure your history is free on all platforms. Oh gosh, I'm doing my best tonight too. Hang in there with me. I've had very little sleep and I'm doing my best. <laughs> So we do our best to make all of our history free on all these platforms, but of course, it's not cheap to run a nonprofit here in San Francisco. Many of you have already made a donation when registering, so thank you so much for that. And many of you are, of course, members. Thank you for being members as well. If you haven't and you can spare some extra change, we'll be very politely adding a donation link to the chat at various points in the evening. And every dollar truly does make a difference to help us stay on track and, you know, pay John for his time. So great timing on popping on, John. <laughs> and one more thing, let's just get a little housekeeping out of the way. We are recording this event and that recording will be added to our YouTube channel later. Please feel free to type your questions into the, the Q&A portion section uh, down at the bottom uh, row. Uh, uh, it says Q&A and there's those little like chat bubbles. We also have a chat going. Uh, Chelsea Sellen, our director of programs, will be keeping an eye on that and can answer any kind of, you know, everyday questions. But if you have a specific question for John, put him in the Q&A and I'll make sure um, he gets the question because it is a webinar. You won't be able to speak to us directly, but we want to make sure we get all of your questions afterwards. And um, do remember that we can see all of your private chats as well. So um, please, please be respectful and, and polite and help us keep this a safe space as we go through our evening. And that goes for all of you viewers and potential commenters on YouTube as well. So with that, I will recede to the background and I will let John Martini take it away. Got it. Hey, thanks, Nicole, and thanks for the intro. Um, for, for those of you who haven't met me, um, my name's John Martini. Uh, I'm from San Francisco, and uh, for 25 years, I was a ranger and an archivist with the National Park Service, the uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area, which includes a lot of the places I used to hang out when I was a kid, including Fort Point. Fort Point fascinated me from the time I was literally about six years old. My mom and dad took me there on one of the rare occasions, about 1957, when the Army opened Old Fort Point to the public. And it was, it was going into a, a storybook castle ruin. I was just fascinated by the scope of the building, the nooks, the crannies, the sounds, the views. 
And um, I learned that the, there was a plan to try to preserve it, to try to tell the story of uh, Fort Point and the American Civil War. Years later, I would end up being, being one of the first um, interpretive staff there at Fort Point in 1971. Uh, it was opened to the public as a new national historic site and they needed volunteers. I was 20 looking for something to do and um, signed up and I began my career there. What I'd like to do is uh, share with you what I've learned about the fort over the years. Uh, in, in the course of my career, I did a tremendous amount of work researching Fort Point, how it was constructed, life there, and how it fit into the larger story of San Francisco and, and the, the American West. When uh, Fort Point was first established, it was on the uh, early days of the California Gold Rush. But of course, there was a history of the area before the fort was built. And uh, courtesy of NASA, let's go up several tens of thousands of feet. And looking straight down on to San Francisco today, with the San Francisco Peninsula at the south and Marin County on the north, and that neck of land, that rather that neck of water separating the two with the Golden Gate Bridge clearly visible. This is the entrance to San Francisco Bay. It, the only way into what many mariners consider the finest natural harbor in the world, over 100 miles of navigable waters fed by uh, numerous streams running down from the Sierras, the Sacramento, the San Joaquin, all emptying in deep water anchorage. And it was amazingly enough, it was an unknown location to everybody except the Native Americans uh, until the 1770s. The native tribes, the uh, first inhabitants were the uh, Ohlone people who lived on the south side of the harbor entrance in what's now San Francisco, and the Miwok people on the north. Go back to the uh, early 1500s, Spain had nominally claimed this whole part of California with uh, out hardly setting a foot on it. They sailed up and down the coast for a couple of hundred years. The, they didn't do much in the way of interact with the native people because there really wasn't a lot here for Spain to start to uh, uh, exploit is the good term. They focused, the Spanish colonists initially focused on Central America, Mexico, where they saw, quote, civilization that they could uh, pillage, gold, advanced cultures by their definition, up here in what they called Alta California, pretty much subsistence folks uh, living close to the land, not a lot of resources to exploit. The Spanish didn't even know San Francisco Bay existed until a group of foot soldiers accidentally in 1769 uh, trying to locate Monterey Bay overshot the mark and they encountered the uh, great arm of the sea extending into the land, uh, what would later be called San Francisco Bay. An early colonial era map of San Francisco Bay showing the harbor entrance at left. Some of our modern landmarks are starting to uh, show up. The Presidio at bottom and Mission San Francisco. Alcatraz's Island in the middle of the bay, more, more of that later, some unnamed rocks, and uh, the narrow entrance gate, the narrow entrance to the Spanish, it was, it was an impediment to crossing the bay to the other side. And despite the fact that the Spanish traditionally gave long names, especially reflecting uh, Catholic heritage to a lot of landmarks, uh, for example, Angel Island was actually La Isla Nuestra de los uh, Angeles. The entrance to the Golden Gate, they simply called, I always found amazing, La Boca, the mouth. That was it. But the Spanish realized as they settled permanently on the San Francisco Peninsula that that entrance there, that narrowest point, what we call the Straits, that was the key to holding San Francisco Bay. And the initial location 
for what we know today as the Presidio of San Francisco. The first folks that got here to establish San Francisco in 1769, they chose a location at the very tip of the northernmost part of the peninsula of San Francisco. Uh, if those first colonists had had their way, and, and this concept stayed until 1776 when people actually arrived on site, the idea of having the Presidio of San Francisco located roughly where the Golden Gate Bridge toll plaza is now, it made sense from a strategic point of view. It made no sense once you tried to occupy the site. Not a lot of water, no cover, no vegetation to speak of, and howling winds and fog. Eventually, the Presidio would be relocated uh, about a mile and a quarter to the southeast where we have the main post today. But that point of land with the red dot on it, the Spanish called Punta del Cantil Blanco, or point of the high white cliffs. They, had a, they looked white and chalky to the Spanish. They weren't done with it. Even though they weren't going to establish the Presidio there, it was decided that they would construct at the very tip of the point, even further north than the, uh, the today's toll plaza site, at the very end, they would construct a tiny fort, uh, a small castle, a castillo. And this point of land, Punta Cantil Blanco, in 1794, it was fortified using labor of uh, Native Americans from the various missions who provided the labor force. The point of land is where Fort Point is going to eventually be located, but it was much different. In this artist's recreation using uh, early surveys of the area, the point of land, it was about 90 feet high. It was on a commanding cliff overlooking uh, La Boca, the Straits. And using the technology that they knew and the architecture, that they brought up with them from the uh, Southwest, it was constructed uh, out of adobe brick. This artist's model shows how the Castillo looked when it was first completed in 1794. It had uh, embrasures, uh, that's the term for uh, ports in the wall through which cannon poked, pretend cannon. The cannon, uh, to get you oriented, the fort is pointing to the north. So those cannon on the left would be facing the Pacific Ocean. Those uh, on the, uh, at the top would be facing directly over the Golden Gate Straits. And that one lonely cannon uh, on the right would be facing into the harbor, uh, chasing any ship that managed to get by. We might wanna mention, you know, who was Spain afraid of at this point? Why were they going to the problem to construct a fortification? Well, a couple of years earlier in 1792, a British explorer, uh, George Vancouver, had visited San Francisco. And Vancouver had uh, noted that there were really no fortifications at the harbor entrance. The only uh, artillery he saw were a couple of cannons outside the walls of the main post of the Presidio, down at you know, today's main post. He dutifully reported this back to the British Admiralty. Word got back to Spain, and Spain said, this, this, this can't be happening. This can't be right. We need fortifications to protect La Bahia de San Francisco. So in 1794, work began on building the Castillo. The guns were antiques. They were brought up actually from uh, San Blas. Some of them had been cast in Peru in the uh, early in the 17th century. Ten guns, adobe walls exposed location. Uh, there wasn't enough of a garrison at the Presidio to keep soldiers at the little fort at all times, so a sentry would visit every day. They did keep stores of gunpowder, and there was a building in the center for the soldiers to sleep in. They would have marched over from the Presidio and garrisoned if there was fear of an invasion. They were always afraid the British might come back, or frankly, anybody with a navy. It could have been the French who could be perceived depending on political climates and how they changed over the years, even the young United States. And essentially, this was Spain's weakest outpost. It was the middle of nowhere, and the fort was here to protect against any foreign fleets. The cannon themselves 
survived the Castillo. The Castillo itself, uh, it melted, it fell apart in earthquakes. It was blown apart by uh, what they called hurricanes. The cannon were shuffled between the Presidio of San Francisco and the Castillo and even up to Sonoma. And in 1846, the Castillo, not only under the control of uh, uh, Republic of Mexico at this time, it had been abandoned for years. And a group of Americans in July 1846, led by John Fremont and Kit Carson, they crossed from Sausalito during the short-lived Bear Flag Revolt. When Americans living in uh, California decided it's time to make California part of the U.S., so they captured the uh, commander in Sonoma. They came down to San Francisco Bay. They rode across from Sausalito, and they uh, called, they spiked the guns at the Castillo, taking rat tail files and hammering them into the the touch holes. Essentially, the cannon couldn't be fired. Is what it was. Here, the the story of the cannon gets a little clouded. Early reports say that. There were a mix of bronze guns and uh, iron guns at the Castillo. Other reports say that there were guns that were brought down from Sonoma. At any rate, six bronze guns still in the Presidio date back to the Spanish-Mexican era. Two of them here in front of the officers club. Uh, uh, two more flanked the main flagpole. Um, I would like to say, surely, you know, it's without a doubt, these guns were spiked by Fremont in the Castillo. We just don't know. The ancient reports contradict what survivor bronze guns, what the Fremont reported spiking were bronze and, and iron and whatever. These things are part of the true cross. These survived no matter where they were the day of American conquest. They survived to uh, be huge parts of our current Hispanic heritage here in San Francisco. San Francisco, originally colonized by Spain in 1822, Mexico got its independence. It became a Mexican possession. A few years later, a little tiny village that called itself Yerba Buena was established on the lee side of the San Francisco Peninsula. And the little town of San Francisco was a polyglot town. There were people from all over the world lived here. It was a trading port. You had uh, Spanish people. You had Hispanic people. You had folks who were called mestizos. Uh, you had Native Americans. You had Polynesians. And they all settled on Yerba Buena Cove surrounding what was called the plaza, a Spanish term. Today we call it Portsmouth Square. In 1846, California and San Francisco became a U.S. possession. Normally what would happen, it would become a territory. And then as the population grew, eventually they'd apply to become a state when the population reached 60,000. Well, that didn't happen. What happened to uh, San Francisco was in January, 1848, gold was discovered. And in January of 1848, historians seem to agree there are about 850 people living in the town of San Francisco, <laughs> many of whom immediately deserted to go to the gold fields to look for gold. San Francisco exploded like no one, what's the phrase, like no one has ever seen before. By July of 1849, there were 5,000 people. By December 1849, there were 25,000 people. By early 1851, there'd be 35,000. And this view of old Yerba Buena Cove, this sun is called the Sea of Masts. These are dozens, if not hundreds, of sailing ships who brought gold seekers in from all over the world who were going to go to the gold fields and looking for gold flake like below, uh, earn, earn their fortune. Well, that didn't happen for most of them. Uh, th there was this huge influx. San Francisco was, it was essentially lawless. Uh, by 1850, the city was um, ruled by gangs at night. Uh, during the day, uh, the downtown was gambling halls and music halls and boarding houses. It was sandy, it was uh, dirty, it was noisy. One historian described the population as young, male, armed, and frequently drunk. This was not a glamorous time in San Francisco's history. It was, it was roughshod, and it was unprotected. <laughs> 
you had this port, San Francisco, that was part of the brand new state. We became a state in 1850. We hit 60,000 people that fast. We were never even a territory. The US Army and the US Navy were tasked with protecting this brand new possession. And it was like nothing anyone uh, had any plans for. It just exploded so quickly that in 1850, a board was convened of army officers and Navy officers to figure out how we're we gonna defend San Francisco. How we gonna, we're a long ways from nowhere, just like for Spain, we're a long ways too. There were no roads across the United States. Uh, to get here, the jumping off point was St. Saint, Saint Joe, Missouri. It took months following a covered wagon walking across the United States, or you could sail around the tip of South America spend four or five months at sea to get to San Francisco. Fastest communication was a ship from uh, say Washington DC to the Isthmus of Panama and then cross the Isthmus of Panama and then hopefully hook up with another ship on the Pacific side, maybe six weeks each way. We had to be prepared if an enemy attacked to be able to protect San Francisco Bay until a relief column could arrive. And that might be over half a year. I can't stress this enough. It wasn't that there was a bunch of gold floating around in San Francisco that made the port uh, important. It was what gold wrought. There was such an influx of people and all of a sudden there were banks, there were shipyards, there was infrastructure going in, piers and wharves. Uh, there was a military presence and uh, in 1849, an arsenal was established in Benicia that held all the ammunition and fortify, uh, gunpowder, explosives, and supplies for the army in the entire Western uh, United States. That had to be protected. In 1854, a mint was established. Uh, gold in flake form is really problematic. The weight varied constantly, what the going exchange rate was varied. So early on, the United States government wanted to establish a mint to convert gold into a coin that had a set value. 1854, the first mints established. Later on, it expands, 1874. And maybe most important for the importance of San Francisco Bay, need to defend it, Mare Island Naval Shipyard. This was a deep water repair facility with dry docks, machine shops. No other country had a naval shipyard equivalent to Mare Island. It would have been a, the whole bay would have been a juicy target. And I got to give, got to say the name, the big foe was Great Britain. Great Britain was not our buddy buddy in the 1849, 1850 time period. We were still renegade from, uh, declaring our independence from the colonies. They had burned Washington DC, including the White House during the War of 1812. They had a major naval installation up in the British Columbia and they had the most powerful fleet in the world. They were the number one fear that we had was the British might try to take over San Francisco. It, it could have also been the French for that matter. Again, anybody with a Navy. America was young and it, we didn't have a huge uh, military presence powerful fleet yet, so we relied on coastal fortifications. That 1850 board that looked at how we're we gonna defend San Francisco, they came up with this concept, simplified the Golden Gate Straits at left with the Presidio and Lime Point facing each other, the Inner Harbor, Angel Island, Alcatraz, and a place called Point San Jose, that's gonna become Fort Mason. Plan is put two major forts, two massive masonry fortifications at the choke point. The choke point is now called the Golden Gate. It's a Yankee term. Actually predated the gold rush, but it caught on. And that was the, called the outer line of defense. That's where you're going to try to stop an enemy fleet from coming in. Anything that gets between, let's give them their names. Uh, in the Presidio, where the location of the old Spanish fort had been, uh, it, it got nicknamed by the Americans um, uh, Punta del Forto or Fort Point, okay? And on Lime Point, Lime Point, 
those were going to be two major caliber forts. Anything that got through there would have to deal with guns on Alcatraz Island. And work began in 1853. John, before you keep going, we have a question. Yes. Jerry wants to know, so Benicia and Mare Island are pretty far from San Francisco. Do you know why they didn't put the support systems closer to the city? Because they wanted them pretty far from San Francisco. for <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, location, location, location. Uh, they figured it would be better to put them further inland in a more defensible site. And uh, uh, Mare Island on the Mare Island Straits, it, uh, early planners decided, do it here. When um, the types of forts that were going to be constructed here in San Francisco, they were part of a nationwide program that had begun after the War of 1812 of constructing massive masonry. I use massive because these things were masonry forts mounting hundreds and hundreds of cannon located at key strategic points. Uh, all except Fort Point were going to be on the East Coast or the Atlantic Coast. They, some of them became famous during the Civil War. Uh, Fort Sumter, Fort Pulaski, this one here, Fort Jefferson and the Dry Tortugas, just massive. They protected anchorages, they protected harbor mouths, they protected river mouths. Uh, Fort Pulaski above, that uh, commanded the mouth of the Savannah River, in the town of Savannah. The U.S. Army engineers had been building these since the 1830s, and it was, they were called third system forts because it was the third uh, program for constructing US military harbor forts. The first was during the Revolutionary War. The second was up to the War of 1812. And then this, uh, these were very standardized in design. Some of them were one story tall, some were two. Uh, Fort Point, Fort Point was gonna be an oddity. Fort Point was three stories tall. It was the. Uh, it was also the last one uh, to be constructed. The fact that the government was going to spend millions of dollars to build a major fortification like this on the wilds of the Pacific Coast shows how important they thought San Francisco was. We do not have photographs of Fort Point under construction, so I'm going to use these to give you an idea of what it took to construct a, a major seacoast fortification like Fort Point. This is a fort at Willits Point in what's today uh, Queens. And uh, like Fort Point, much of it was built of granite and a huge maze of overhead straight leg cranes had to be installed to move the uh, endless tons of granite that went into construction of fortifications like this. In San Francisco, there was no source of good granite nearby. As planning for the fort began, the original idea was to build it of granite, good material. However, you can't find it here. So beginning in 1853, when work began on the fort, they sent to it to China and uh, brought in Chinese granite to begin constructing the foundations and the first tier of the fort at, at Fort Point. It says a lot about that this was still really the wild frontier. Oh, there were brickyards, there were construction firms here, but they couldn't turn out the materials, uh, the, the, the granite, the, the brick, the wood that met the specifications, the strict specifications that the US Army engineers had for building seacoast forts. They had to go, had to, go to China. Eventually there were local brickyards. Uh, granite was found up near, near Folsom in Sacramento, but we started using heavily imported granite. In 1854, plan for Fort Point. This, the earliest plan, however, that really shows the fort in a recognizable way. Mentioned before, most of these third system forts were two stories or maybe uh, three stories tall. Two stories of uh, casemates, guns firing through the wall, and a third story guns on the roof. Well, Fort Point was going to be one of only two that had three stories of casemates and a fourth tier of, uh, of guns. Uh, the walls were going to be relatively thick, seven feet plus. I've read histories that say in some cases, Fort Point's walls are 13 feet thick. Yeah, well, that's 
probably at the angle where there's extra uh, reinforcements built in. The walls average about seven feet thick, still pretty dang impressive. In this photo here, rather this plan, it shows the existing topography when the engineers first sur surveyed the site. That's how we were able to build that, uh, that model of how the fort looked. But if you look closely, lower left, that weird horseshoe, that's the outline of what was left of Castillo de San Joaquin when they began work on Fort Point. They uh, noted its location. Um, briefly, just before work began, the army put a few cannon inside the old adobe walls, pulled them out quickly. And then work began on tearing down the entire Punta del Cantil Blanco. It had been about 90 feet high. Military uh, thinking at the time said, you don't want your fort on top of a hill shooting down. You want your fort built as close to the water level as possible so that the cannon on the lowest level, like here the, showing finish fort point, the cannon could fire out just a few feet above the water level and not making this up, skip the cannonballs across the wave tops to better hit an approaching ship at its water line. The photo shows there's a huge reduction in height. To give you an idea, Fort Point's about 45 feet tall. Punta Cantil Blanco is about 90. So um, the first couple of years were spent merely cutting the, uh, the point down, cutting the point of land that was being called Fort Point. Um, they didn't have a name yet, the new work, W-O-R-K, that the engineers were in, engaged on. All the early plans call it, I think it's the fort at Fort Point. That was it. Later on, uh, uh, formal names would be proposed. They never really caught on. The nickname for the site, Fort Point, became the name of the structure. I mentioned Fort Point was unique. Cutaway showing the different levels with guns. Three levels of guns, these are called casemates. Got getting kind of wonky here, the terminology. But they were enclosed gun rooms. Uh, they fire, the cannon fired through openings in the wall called either gun ports or technically they were embrasures. These are the guns that had the most protection. These are the ones where the walls are five, maybe seven feet thick. Uh, the, now, they were kind of constrained. You could only fire through a little opening. Oh, but on the very top, you had cannon mounted on uh, actually 360 degree turntables. This was called the barbette tier. Fort was designed to hold inside its walls 136 cannon. And to be honest, it, it never had that many, almost none of these forts. And there were 40 forts of this design along the uh, East Coast and the Gulf Coast, uh, only uh, uh, Fort Point on the West Coast. They were almost never totally armed, partly because it took decades to build these things usually. And uh, they, there was no real hurry because there was no war on. Fort Point got a lot of priority. It was uh, constructed in eight years, I believe due to the remoteness of the site and the continuing fears of, uh, of European dominance on the Pacific coast. The cutaway also shows a change that happened. Once the fort was underway, they, after they had finished the first tier in brick, or rather in uh, granite, they switched to all brick. Why? Because commercial brickyards were turning out brick of sufficient quality. And the army even has, uh, built their own brickyard at one point to make sure there were enough brick for the millions and millions of bricks involved. I'm using a photograph of old Ironsides here because this was the thinking of this was the type of ship that was going to maybe attack San Francisco. Wooden walls, uh, wind powered, manned by hundreds of sailors, elaborate rigging. This 1850s, the thinking was still going back to the 1830s when this uh, type of fort was first designed. The idea of a wind powered ship slowly moving past Fort Point and the planned fort on the north side of the Golden Gate, it could be attacked from two sides at once, just basically blown into, uh, blown into splinters. 
if anyone doesn't know, nobody ever actually attacked. This was all built in preparation for wars that came but never brushed on the shores of San Francisco Bay. Uh, the Fort Point itself would be used through uh, three different wars, a civil war and two world wars, and, and never see action. The type of enemy would change though, and we'll get into that a bit as, as we go by. John, before you keep going, we have another question. Yes, sir. So Matt wants to know, did the same army laborers who built Fort Point also construct the fortifications on Alcatraz? Not the exact same guys, but it was the same engineers that were overseeing the works. These, guys, these engineers were trained at West Point. Uh, they had uh, worked under senior engineers at other fortifications on the uh, East Coast and the Gulf Coast. And then eventually they were sent out here to San Francisco. There was a supervising engineer who I believe uh, stayed in the Presidio. And there were younger engineers who were assigned to be uh, uh, boots on the ground on Alcatraz Island and at Fort Point. At one point, a young engineer uh, uh, named uh, Robert E. Lee Jr. was uh, at uh, Fort Point. So uh, many notable Civil War figures came through these forts, especially during their developmental era. I'm, I'm glad Matt asked about uh, Alcatraz. The Army made a change here. Instead of trying to level the entire island, it was figured that because it was so far inside the bay, over two and a half miles from Fort Point, the real action was going to take place at the Narrows at Fort Point. Cannon on Alcatraz could be mounted higher up on the uh, uh, natural rock walls of the island, and uh, the cannon there could reach greater ranges and uh, start to deal with uh, ships entering the harbor at a much distant range. Fort Point or Alcatraz was like nothing else the army built during this time period. This is the only place where we know where they uh, took uh, natural rock and converted it into a fort, and that may be the reason that the island is a uh, early on was referred to as the rock as early as 1880, similar to the rock of Gibraltar. Uh, cannon here, the same type of cannon, uh, identical to the ones uh, at Fort Point, mounted in an open barbette battery, and it gets you oriented, that's the Marin headlands in the background. Most of the cannon on Alcatraz were aimed at Fort Point. Again, this idea that you're, you're gonna stop the bad guys at the harbor entrance. Yeah, Fort, Fort Point, get into the nitty gritty of it. Interior view of Fort Point. Here on the top level, cannon uh, on the circular granite platforms, they could rotate 360 degrees. Theoretically, they could be turned and aimed so that they could fire and first engage an approaching ship about uh, seal rocks or land's end. And then as the ship came closer and closer, more and more guns could be aimed at it. And as it tried to pass the fort itself, the guns on the roof and the guns inside the uh, casemates, those arched rooms below, they would all be brought to bear on the passing ship. Now, I read that the maximum range of uh, two and a half miles, the maximum accuracy was about 5%. This is one reason you have over 126 guns, you know, in one structure. Um, but as the guns uh, bore closer, as the ship approached, accuracy was much, much improved. And the, the best a ship could do passing Fort Point itself would be to stay, be ha only half a mile away, a couple of thousand feet. And then once it passed Fort Point, had to face Alcatraz. Three sides of the fort were cannon facing over the water on the lower floors. Uh, here you can see the south side of the fort. On the south side of the fort, the only cannon were on the, the very top level. Uh, use the term, it's called the barbette. The lower floors, this is where the uh, troops lived. The enlisted soldiers lived in barracks rooms. Oh, 24 men crammed into a uh, a single arched brick room. The officers had the middle floor, 
uh, generally a pair of them sh shared a large room. They had individual bedrooms. They had a parlor. At the left end, there were mess rooms for the enlisted guys on the top floor, officers on the second. First floor was a mishmash, powder magazines, workshops, a jail. Uh, it was called the guard room, the officer's office. Uh, this was, again, pretty standard design features. There was no identical fort to Fort Point, just like there was no identical fort to any of the other of the 40 third system forts. What they all had in common was the span of the arches, the way that the walls were constructed, the way that the gun platforms were constructed, uh, the way the gorge rooms were built. These features were reincorporated over and over again. There's a cute little feature that disappeared uh, in the, during the fort's history. This was a furnace, one of two that were in the, uh, it's called the parade ground, the big central open area of the fort. These were uh, furnaces for heating cannonballs until they were red hot. When the cannonballs were red hot, they could be very quickly loaded into one of the cannon on the ground floor, obscured in the shadows there. And uh, sounds kind of crazy. You're going to put a red hot cannonball into a cannon that already has a big load of powder in it. Well, you shoved a bunch of wet straw in between the gunpowder and the red hot cannonball. The cannon started to steam and you fired it really fast. The cannon, the ball would, uh, it was called hot shot and it would ricochet atop the waves, not losing its heat and embed itself in the wooden walls of the uh, attacking warship. It was considered to be a, a standard accepted tactic probably pretty terrifying to actually watch while it was in process. We're talking a lot about the fort, the brick walls, the parade ground, the cannon, but Fort Point was not just a building, it was also the land that surrounded the fort. Outside the walls of the fort, there were workshops, there was what's called a sutler's store, uh, like a 7-Eleven a, a where the soldiers could go shopping for stuff the army wasn't issuing them. And down near what's today's uh, warming hut, or sometimes we call it the uh, South Beach parking lot or Chrissy Field, there was an extensive complex where, from my reading, most of the soldiers lived. Uh, nobody wanted to be crammed inside those uh, dingy brick barracks rooms inside the fort. They were cold, they were wet, they were nasty, they, uh, these barracks, the big buildings on the left, these were more spacious, there was better air, they had porches, and the smaller buildings in the foreground, those were uh, kitchens, mess halls. Uh, in the far background on the right, there's a stable building. You can even see in the original photograph at far right, there's laundry flapping on the breeze. There were women, uh, they, were, they were called laundresses that were assigned to the garrison. They were actually part of the army. They received a stipend. Uh, generally, they were married to enlisted soldiers or to, to NCOs, but there was this whole vanished village of Fort Point, of barracks buildings, support structures. Some of these lasted all the way to the 20th century. When I talked to people about Fort Point, I tried to get them to understand, yes, soldiers lived in the fort. But most of them would, if they had their druthers, and depending on the numbers of men present, they probably would have been living in these slightly more remote barracks. Now, they're, they're within a five minute march of the fort, uh, but uh, forts are notoriously gloomy. John, that was such a cool photo. I have a couple questions. One, yes. where is it from? And two, is that a water flume in the background? Yes, it's from the National Archives. The photo was uh, sent to uh, the War Department in, I think, 1865 to uh, document the barracks area. And uh, yeah, the water flume, that's the famous water flume that we talk about that brought water from Lobos Creek all the way around the cliffs of the Presidio, past Fort Point, and eventually it's going to make its way all the way to Fort Mason. It, as the 1850s progressed, 
Fort Point was being built. It was going to be almost complete in 1861. And what's happening is on the East Coast, the United States is marching to civil war. Uh, starting in late 1860, states decided that they had just had enough of the United States. Uh, slave states decided that their peculiar institution, as they called it, uh, protecting that took precedence over northern states moves for abolition. And one by one, being with South Carolina, states began to drop out of the United States to form the Confederate States of America. San Francisco, California, it was a free state. Uh, yes, there were enslaved people in California who had been brought here by Southern slaveholders, but we were a uh, free state. San Francisco was uh, notoriously a pro-union uh, abolitionist. Further you got south, San Jose and below, you found more people who were in favor of the Confederacy and in, uh, and in favor of uh, enslaved uh, practices. And it all came to a head in early 1861 when the Confederacy totally pulled out. The Civil War began April 12th, 1861, when Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, another one of the third system forts, manned by United States Army troops, was fired on by uh, Confederate troops. Uh, we were at Civil War. We weren't feeling too good here because the fellow who was in charge of all the U.S. military in the West was a famous U.S. Army officer named Albert Sidney Johnston. He had become famous uh, during the, the, the Mexican War and uh, several campaigns against Native Americans. And uh, uh, Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, said, this is the finest officer in the United States Army. I want him in command of my troops. Well, Albert Sidney Johnston was a diehard Southerner, but he was also a West Point man. And unlike a lot of his uh, traitorous um, brethren, he maintained his command and stayed loyal to the United States until he was relieved of command. Uh, he took great measures. He ordered Fort Point garrisoned. Uh, there were no guns yet, but he ordered troops into the fort in uh, February 1861 to make sure that local secessionists, Southern sympathizers, wouldn't take the fort over. He ordered uh, ammunition brought down from Benicia and stored on Alcatraz to keep it away from secessionists. There was a lot of talk that uh, he's he's a, he's going to be a traitor and turn us over. Um, I, I will not speak for his actions fighting for the Confederacy, but as long as he was a U.S. Army officer, he was loyal. And uh, he actually threw a bunch of secessionists out of his office that uh, tried to see if maybe he'd leave the door to Fort Point unlocked one night, wink, wink. Um, when did we find out the Civil War began? Well, it began April 12th, 1861. Johnson had moved people into Fort Point in anticipation, but there were no cannon yet. This was all, everybody knew war was coming. The drums were beating, states were, were dropping out of the Union. There was a beleaguered uh, US Army command that was at Fort Moultrie, later moved on to uh, Fort Sumter and Charleston Harbor. And if it was only a matter of time till war came to the United States. Charleston was indeed fired on April 12th, 1861. Here's how we heard out about it. I point out the date at upper right, April 25th, 1861. And there's the article, arrival of the pony attack on Fort Sumter. It took us almost two weeks to know that we were at war out here. Uh, a couple of days later, word came that Johnston's relief had been assigned and uh, Johnston left. He, he would die at the Battle of Shiloh fighting for the Confederacy. Here we are, we're, we're months and months away from communication with the rest of the United States. The fastest we can get word is gonna be 12 days. There, there's no telegraph left. Figuring also that the Confederates, although they didn't have a real true Navy at the start, they had a very powerful uh, friend in Great Britain. Great Britain kept moving ahead with the idea of modern ships, modern artillery. They had the greatest Navy in the world. Uh, they were the greatest empire in the world in the 19th century. And among other things, they were pioneering in ships that were light years beyond what Fort Point had been built to deal with. This is HMS Warrior launched in 1860. 
uh, don't let the mass fool you. She had uh, steam engines and she was iron hulled, mounted with rifled guns. Great Britain was heavily on the side of the Confederacy for economic reasons. The mills of Great Britain ran on Southern cotton. Great Britain openly supported the Confederacy, although they never officially said that they were uh, on the side of the Confederacy. They built ships for the Confederacy. They provided crews for Confederate ships. If one of these uh, ships should show up in uh, the Pacific Ocean, we, we could be in deep trouble. And I haven't gone into this in depth yet, but we need to. There was a huge chink in the armor here. Fort Point at the northern tip of the San Francisco Peninsula. There's the Marin Shore on the other side. There's no fort. That arrow points to where the Lime Point Fort, the companion to Fort Point, was supposed to be built. The army ran into a rat's nest of conflicting legal claims over who owned Lime Point. Uh, it was part of what's called Rancho Sausalito. Now, the Presidio and Alcatraz, those were U.S. government property. There was never any qualms about who and them. The Marin Headlands, first um, a, a fellow by the name of uh, Richardson, later a fellow by the name of Throckmorton, they owned, they weren't interested in selling. Oh, right, they were interested in selling at an exorbitant price. And until 1866, a year after the Civil War, negotiations went back and forth about buying Line Point. The fort was never built. But there were plans, this is what the fort would have looked like had it been built. Uh, kind of similar to Fort Point, only three tiers high instead of Fort Point's four. But this would have been the uh, crossfire at the choke point. I like to say that it, if it was the golden gate, if it was a real gate, you only had one, one half of the, of the double gate, the south side, Fort Point. The north side, undefended. And uh, it was realized that a, a fast ship on a foggy night on a ebb tide could maybe, or a flood tide could maybe make its way, hugging the Marin Cliffs, uh, get past Fort Point, get into the Inner Harbor. Beginning in 1863, backup forts were built. If they couldn't build up Lion Point, they built uh, temporary batteries. The US uh, Army constructed gun batteries on uh, the San Francisco shore at a place they called Point San Jose, today Fort Mason. They expanded the gun batteries on uh, Alcatraz Island. Alcatraz was now seen as really key to defending the harbor. If anything got past Fort Point, it would have to get past Fort Mason, would have to get past the expanded batteries on Alcatraz and batteries on Angel Island. They were very concerned about Angel Island because that was the passageway up to Benicia and up to Mare Island Naval Shipyard. Uh, these were extremely quick, uh, called down and dirty gun batteries. Dig a hole in the ground, plop some cannon in them and re revet the um, excavation with uh, some brick and, and wood palisades. But this, this is what passed for the fortifications. So here's your 1864. Fort Point at the left, nothing in Marin, but on Angel Island, three different gun batteries, Alcatraz and, and Fort Mason. So you went from having a dependence on the outer line of defense at Fort Point, now the defense is Alcatraz Island. There were, there were additional fortifications planned for Rincon Point. There was even a Union um, uh, gunboat, an ironclad, called the Comanche that was sent here during the Civil War. Different talk. Uh, I get in, into what happened, but we thoroughly thought that at some point we were gonna, we were gonna be attacked. Changes happened during the Civil War in military technology. Not just what I mentioned with the British and HMS Warrior, but the United States itself pioneered with what are called ironclads and uh, the most famous ironclads were the two shown here, the CSS Confederate States ship, Virginia at the top, which was basically a floating uh, armored box, steam powered with cannon shooting out the side, and lower the USS Monitor, the first real true battleship, a flat deck, a rotating turret with a couple of cannon, 
And these two duked it out on the morning of March 9th, March 9th, 1862 in Hampton Roads. It's a long way from San Francisco, but it's going to have some repercussions. Following uh, the battle, the Virginia retreated. She never came back again. Neither ship sunk each other. They each sustained heavy damage, but they remained operational. Here's the USS Monitor showing the impact of the cannonballs from the heavy guns of the, of the uh, CSS Virginia. And it should be noted, the Navy guns were very similar to guns on land forts. More monitors were built. Here's one called USS Passaic after she made a run past a Confederate controlled fort. Again, damage, but these ships survived. Unlike the wooden walled ships of uh, Old Ironsides era, these ships could take a pounding. It would, it would have been incalculably dangerous and noisy to be inside, but all of a sudden, the forts and their guns, they could be overcome. And the forts themselves, here, here's Fort Point, seen from the Golden Gate. Turns out that uh, not only were the guns in them not going to be able to do much damage to enemy ironclads, the forts themselves were giant targets. The fort here, well, see, the walls are 45 feet tall. You can clearly see that three levels of uh, uh, gun embrasures, the, the gun openings. Similar to Fort Point, as I had mentioned, other third system forts. Let's take a look at the classic. Fort Pulaski, which was outside uh, Savannah, Georgia. It was occupied by Confederates. It had been seized by Confederates. The fear of what would have happened to Fort Point, thank God it didn't. Union forces brought up siege guns to blast the Confederates out of Fort Pulaski. This wall here, they fired with uh, classic cannonballs. You can see huge, dense, large areas of broken brick splayed out. This is the type of uh, attack that the forts had been built for. They had been built to last weeks or months. Water was on hand, food was on, uh, on hand, ammunition. Well, there was one corner of Fort Pulaski where a modern gun design was ordered to focus its fire. Several were called rifled cannon were brought up, not firing cannonballs, firing round or rather uh, pointed projectiles much more accurate, much more penetrating power. And after 30 hours, this is what that part of Fort Pulaski looked like. Walls were totally penetrated. Projectiles were flying through the opening in the walls, clear across the uh, Pulaski's huge parade ground, and they were smashing on the outside of the powder magazine. At this point, the Confederates surrendered. Um, didn't last four weeks, didn't last six weeks, didn't even last a day and a half. Something totally different happened in Charleston at Fort Sumter, uh, where the war began. The Union soldiers inside Fort Sumter surrendered relatively quickly. The Confederates took over, and the Union was determined they were going to take Fort Sumter back. Beginning in uh, April of uh, 1863, they began a series of assaults on Fort Sumter, uh, guns mounted on shore, Guns firing out of ironclads circling the fort. The Confederates kept fighting back. They could not get Pulaski, uh, they could not get the fort to surrender. The Confederates were well prepared. They had filled much of the interior of the fort with sand to withstand the bombardment. Two years of bombardment, Pulaski or Fort Sumter was reduced to essentially a mountain of broken brick. And there were men living inside the tunnels inside this mountain of broken brick. They couldn't really answer. The cannon were no longer serviceable, but the fort was holding out. But it wasn't a fort anymore. It wasn't, it wasn't a defensive feature. Th there was a rude awakening. At the end of the Civil War, the US engineers basically figured all of their massive construction efforts that had taken place from the 1830s to the 1860s, everything was obsolete. Um, Maybe obsolescence, a better term. The cannon were still there. They were still uh, ready to defend the country. But at what price? What good is it having a fort that can't withstand attack, that can't sink an attacking enemy ship? A lot of experimentation went on. 
One thing that happened in the years following the Civil War, newer cannon, more powerful cannon, were mounted inside the walls of the existing third system forts. This, these were uh, cannon, they were, uh, they had a name, they were called Rodman cannon, named after the ordnance officer who designed them. Sometimes they were called seltzer bottle cannon because they were shaped like old fashioned seltzer bottles. Fort Point, beginning in 1868, a lot of its cannon were replaced by these seltzer bottle Rodmans. To bring it back to Fort Point, that was, what are we gonna do with Fort Point? It's, it's, it's a four story target. Uh, sure, we put new cannon in it. Um, maybe we can cover the walls with uh, giant cast iron sheets. Well, they tried that in some uh, forts on the East Coast. And all that happened is when you uh, fired a cannon against the big cast iron sheets covering the fort's walls, it just relayed the impact onto the brick. And the damage was even worse than if the cannons had fired directly onto the brick. Uh, massive fissures were developed. There was a plan never implemented to simply tear down Fort Point and build a giant monitor type turret uh, on, on the foundations of the old fort. And there was going to be another uh, turret on the Marin side. They hadn't given up on the idea of a fort on the Marin side yet. Neither of these happened. The fort amazingly would stay pretty much as it had originally been built. What happened was newer fortifications were built on the hill above the fort. And beginning in 1870, there's a nationwide plan that new forts aren't gonna look like they used to. They're, they're gonna look like this. This is a uh, plan of 1870 fort in the Presidio. These forts, well, they learned. They learned uh, during the Civil War that the best protection for the forts and the soldiers and the cannon isn't massive thicknesses of brick or masonry, it's massive amounts of dirt piled up. A cannonball can just bury itself in the dirt. And one reports that a couple of soldiers under cover of darkness could fill in the damage with, with shovels. The idea was these 1870s forts simplified nationwide plan constructed economically. Uh, they looked like this. You had two cannon. These were monstrously large cannon. They fired a 15 inch diameter cannonball uh, weighing 440 pounds. There would be two of them mounted side by side and they'd be separated by an earthen traverse, an artificial hill. And inside the artificial hill, you could have storage or, or ammunition magazine. Then you'd have two more cannon and then you'd have another traverse. Then you'd have two more cannon. On the hills above Fort Point, there were a mile and a half of these uh, gun positions laid out. And they were still considered part of Fort Point. They were called Battery East, because it was to the east of the fort, and Battery West. Very simplified names. Work went on from 1870 to 1876, constructing this mile and a half long line of uh, earthworks, only to have the whole project shut down in 1876 when only a handful of cannon had been uh, mounted. Why? Congress was tired of funding the Army and the Navy and never-ending arms races, especially after everything that they had built prior to the Civil War was now all of a sudden obsolete. Both the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy were re relegated to about 13th level pow world powers in terms of defenses. Didn't stop Europe. Europe was still plowing ahead with new types of artillery, new types of uh, fortifications, new types of ships. By the late 1880s, the French, the Germans were building ships of this design. This was the uh, French battleship Charles Martel, uh, mounted a couple of high powered 12 inch guns in turrets. They'd learned that from the Americans. Uh, 10 inch guns, five inch guns, torpedo tubes, thick armor plating on the sides, and the thing could go 18 knots. Old Ironsides, I think, maxed out about eight knots. So the, all of a sudden, our aging brick and earthwork fortifications are faced with essentially modern warships. Congress eventually relented and beginning in 1890, new generations of fortifications began to be built around the United States. San Francisco and New York had the highest priority for new fortifications and what was called the 
Endicott era of, uh, of construction. Began in San Francisco, 1890, continued to uh, 1905. And radically different design. We're not talking earthen forts here. We're talking forts made of uh, massive amounts of concrete. Uh, ammunition stored on lower floors, ammunition hoists, elevators to bring the ammunition up. And the guns themselves were light years ahead of the cannon at Fort Point or even the Rodman guns of the 1870s. Now we're modern guns. They call them high power guns, firing artillery projectiles. Eight miles, maybe more, with an extremely high degree of, of, of accuracy. Uh, and the thinking began to change. Sure, we're going to have guns in the Presidio. Yeah, we're going to have lots of guns in the Presidio. But we don't need to have all of our guns located at the Presidio. We can start moving over into Marin, which the Army finally bought in 1866, and build additional gun batteries over there. So new forts started to pop up. Uh, what we call Forts Baker and Barry, later Cronkite. The U.S. Coast Artillery was, uh, was being born and it was being perfected here in San Francisco. That, so Fort Point, obsolete, obsolescent, but a landmark. New fortifications, as I mentioned, were being built on the hills above the fort. But doesn't mean the fort had no use. Uh, soldiers were actually manning the fort in, until 1868 when they were officially pulled out. And then sporadically through the 1870s and 80s and even the 1890s, soldiers would come back to the fort. A lot of times they were in there for brief periods to learn to train on the uh, antique cannon that were mounted in the fort, but that still formed the backstay of, of, of our defenses. Just because we didn't have the most modern artillery didn't mean you didn't practice with what you have. Uh, this photo here is taken about 1890. It came from the California State Library. And looking at it, I, I finally realized what was going on. Uh, I zoom in a bit. There's a whole ton of people standing on the uh, roof of the fort. And uh, what are they doing? If you look at the extreme right, that's that's a giant puff of uh, smoke from uh, black powder, the gunpowder. The fort's guns are holding artillery practice. And follow the dotted line, the shooting at the Marin Shore. There's lots of reports of Fort Point firing towards Marin. Sometimes they'd uh, paint a big whitewash splash on the rocks near, uh, this, in this case, near Kirby Cove. Other times there'd be a there'd, there'd be a barrel, an anchored barrel with a flag on it, anchored just offshore, and they'd fire at that. This was a a tough time. These are the years when the government really wasn't financing the military very well. Some of the uh, uh, artillery pieces and and the troops that fired them they were limited to one shot per year. Accuracy wasn't very good. In in many ways. Old Fort Point and the fortifications were becoming a joke. This is the eve, though, of the modern coast artillery that we just alluded to. Um, before I leave this photo, you'll notice that at the foot of the fort's walls, there's a whole bunch of wagons tied up. And uh, under enlargement, you can see there's a pile of cannon. They're starting to disarm the fort. The cannon that were being pulled out and lined up like cordwood, these are the old gold rush era forts uh, and cannon. The guns that lasted the longest, they, they were the big Rodman guns. The fort also became something of a tourist attraction. An oddity of Fort Point is we don't have any of that great Ken Burns stuff where people wrote letters describing life in the fort or they took pictures of each other during the, the Civil War years. We have more, we have all kinds of pictures of tourists looking at the fort in the 1870s and the 1880s, wandering around, you know, having their happy snaps taken. First time we have pictures of soldiers in the fort isn't until the 20th century. We know they were in there. Was it a restriction against taking pictures inside the fort? But why no personal memoirs, no letters written? 
we only have official official government reports to go by. How many men were uh, assigned? How many were on sick leave? What were the names of the commanding officers? And correspondence when you know people had grievances, like the laundresses, you know, feeling they're being stiffed of the money that they're be paid by the soldiers. We just don't have a lot of that human life slice of life stuff about Fort Point. Uh, every once in a while, things bubble to the surface. This one showed up on eBay. Mrs. Uh, Ada Rolofsson, her uh, husband was a pioneer photographer. Somehow he got her to pose on a cannon inside the, one of the casemates at Fort Point. These help bring the place alive. And the same view today. Nineteen hundred soldiers regarrisoned the fort, not to man its cannon, but they were housed there because these were the troops of the uh, heavy artillery that was going to man the new cannon in the new concrete batteries that were popping up on the hill behind <clears throat> behind the fort. Um, about this time, the entire reservation of Fort Point, meaning the fort the outbuildings, the uh, Rodman Cannon on the earthworks, it was redesignated as Fort Winfield Scott, a name that survives today in the Presidio. Um, the old brick building was sometimes called Fort Winfield Scott, but the name just persisted, Old Fort Point. This picture was taken, we know, before, uh, the 19, before 1905 because the uniforms the guys are wearing. To the right, the little temporary building, that was the a tiny post exchange where you could go and maybe get a beer, you know, buy toiletries, maybe have a game of checkers. It, this is the earliest photograph we have of soldiers at Fort Point. We got Mrs. Ruloffson on her cannon inside, uh, you know, taken maybe uh, 20 years earlier. Where were the soldiers? 1912. Uh, to me, this was the oddest period of the fort's history, 1912, 1913, Panama Canal's nearing completion. The army has a giant brand new disciplinary barracks on Alcatraz Island. The army got it in their head that immigration service and uh, the war department should work hand in glove and uh, take Alcatraz, which is brand new, and convert it to an immigration station. What are you going to do with the army prisoners who are in the disciplinary barracks on Alcatraz? Well, move them to Fort Point. And for a year-long process during 1914, Alcatraz prisoners were brought over uh, to work at the fort. They converted the interior. Whatever was left of the artillery was removed. The gun openings, the casemates, they were walled in. Windows were created. These were going to become cell rooms for the prisoners. New plumbing was installed. Some interior walls were, were ripped out to make room for a barracks for the guards who were going to work. New mess halls constructed. As it turns out, this all went on without congressional approval or congressional appropriation of funds to do it. It seems to have been carried out using what we call discretionary funds by the War Department. And when it was uh, finished sometime in 1914, no convicts were ever transferred over. The army decided that Angel, or rather the uh, immigration service said uh, a new complex on Angel Island would suit their needs more. So Alcatraz remained as an army prison and Fort Point was converted to a never used prison. Nineteen. 20s dragged on through the early 1930s. The fort is got, I should say, no building on an army base goes to waste. The fort was the scene of, uh, although never completed as, uh, as display barracks, during World War I, there was uh, a motor pool and uh, classrooms where guys were uh, taught uh, motor repair inside the casemates. On top of the fort, a signal station was constructed where guys using everything from signal flags to uh, blinker lights learned how to communicate with the other 
forts in the harbor. Simultaneously, this guy is starting to bang the drum ever louder to build a bridge across the Golden Gate. Uh, Chief Engineer Joseph Strauss, visionary, had the uh, idea that he could pull together building a, a bridge across the Golden Gate Strait, something that was deemed to be impossible. There were a couple of pro many problems he would have to face. Uh, first was getting public support for a, a god awful looking structure that the media called an upside down rat trap. And it went through variations. His drumbeat included the idea that the benefits to bridging the Golden Gate economically for development, both for San Francisco and Marin, were, were just going to be unheard of. Finally, the bridge uh, designs evolved to something recognizable. More public support was built. And plans began uh, in the early 1930s for how to build the bridge. There were going to be a lot of challenges, one of which would involve Fort Point. The cables that hold up the Golden Gate Bridge had to be anchored to massive 60,000 ton concrete blocks to hold the bridge uh, tight as it stretched across the Golden Gate. And to, one of these concrete blocks was supposed to go exactly where Fort Point sits. Uh, it made sense. It's the tip of the land. This is where the anchors take place. Well, part of the deal of building the Golden Gate Bridge that the army had uh, demanded of the bridge district was if you build this thing, any buildings that get moved or demolished, you have to compensate the army for. And demolishing Fort Point would have been such a, 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 an unimaginable cost, and it, how long would it have taken, that it was decided that it was easier to leave the fort in place. And also Joseph Strauss, the chief engineer, he, he respected the Mason's art. He said it was a historic gem, you know? So let's save it. Idea was build an arch. Here's the bridge in its simplest form, showing at left an anchorage where Fort Point was supposed to be. How'd they save the fort? They pushed the anchorage to the left out of view in the second photo, and they put an arch spanning. The cables still are anchored, but they're just anchored deeper in the ground uh, and behind Fort Point rather than on top of Fort Point. Unfortunately, part of the fort had to be demolished to make way for the bridge. This picture was taken uh, about a month after work began constructing it. And it, the fort had an outer work. It had a, a masonry exterior gun battery that was uh, called a, a counter scarp gallery. It, it's jargon. It was detached from the original fort. It sat across a uh, the moat and aimed back at the walls of the fort. It was right in the way of where the construction had to take place. It was blown up, cleared away. And then the uh, bridge uh, work, the construction began. This, this is a lovely photograph, or actually lovely painting, showing by 1934, the rising towers of the bridge, the buttresses, and how Fort Point had been spared. There's the big 60,000 ton anchor blocks in the foreground, dug 40 feet into the, into the bedrock. I also like this picture because if you little uh, houses with the red roofs at right, those were the lighthouse keepers houses for the light atop Fort Point. They were moved in the course of building the Golden Gate Bridge. And the finished arch. Yeah. Only reason it exists, save old Fort Point. The bridge district pretty much took over the fort during the four years the fort was being constructed. Offices, uh, they stored, probably using the old powder magazines, dynamite that divers were using to blow up the bottom of the bay to create the footings for the bridge. There was a, a uh, commissary or a snack bar inside the fort where bridge workers could uh, you know, take their breaks. And on top of the fort, they set up this series of uh, panels. I wish this was color. Each one of these panels, steel panels, was a different paint formula and a slightly different color. They were experimenting to see what color and what manufacturer worked best 
uh, taking the full brunt of the Pacific Ocean. The bridge idea for the bridge changed uh, a couple of times in terms of color. Silver was considered, gray was considered, black was considered. They pretty much decided uh, as the towers were going up that it should be painted in variations of, uh, of uh, rust red, uh, what became known as international orange, and maybe using gold on the cables that uh, suspended the bridge deck. An economy move, they decided, hey, just the simple red lead color looks just the best. Make it into a fernal, uh, formal top coat, called it international orange and you have a solid orange bridge. No variations, came in under budget. John, not to backtrack, but many of us are intrigued by the snack bar in Fort yes. Point. <laughs> Where was it located? <laughs> it was on the, uh, yeah, it's it was on the second tier on the uh, north side in um, a pre, I'll back up. Okay, you see that ramp in the background of the uh, the uh, the autos? Yep. It's up to the double doors. Inside there, that was the snack. That was that was the snack bar. Uh, we're going to launch a formal campaign now to bring back the snack bar. I think we should. The, the uh, <laughs> yeah, the warming hut isn't enough. Nope, it, it it is not. Their sandwiches are not on par anymore. <laughs> Well, oh, okay, so Chelsea has another question about the snack bar. What should be sold at the Fort Point snack bar, in your professional opinion, John? Really bad coffee and uh, stale donuts. Very she, 1930s. She votes churros, but we can have a discussion about this later. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when World War II broke out, soldiers came back to the fort, not to occupy it as barracks, but as a fort, again, there was, oh, just as there had been during the Civil War, there was a real fear that we might be attacked here in San Francisco. Uh, the Japanese Imperial Navy, maybe relying on submarines, might try to get in through the Golden Gate. And in uh, early 1942, a number of cannon uh, artillery pieces were brought over from Marin County and mounted on top of the fort. And again, this is infuriating. This photo is the only photo we have from World War II at Fort Point. A uh, sort of a woe-begone looking sentry with his World War I uh, rifle guarding the Sally Port. No other photos exist. This is um, Fort Moultrie on the East Coast. This is the type of gun. This is how the gun crew would have looked. They lived in the second and third floor tiers. They just adapted the old barracks from the Civil War to a modern war. And up until late 1944, there were soldiers, once again, assigned to Fort Point. The guns themselves probably removed right at the end of World War II. There was a big scrapping of guns in 1945, 1946. All that's left to document this uh, last era of the fort's use as a defensive point are these uh, giant concrete blocks, uh, four of them, that were uh, without planning, just cast directly on top of the original uh, 1860s uh, granite gun platforms. John, we have a question about the bricks. Yeah. Any idea what they were made of? Was it McNears and Marin? Most of them were built by the Army's own brickyard. I don't think McNears was operational in the 1850s. I could look that up. Yeah. they. Uh, the, uh, the army eventually went to various suppliers. You hear this ten, uh, a, little, uh, a little tenacious in, in my response here. I'll find out whether or not McNears was providing bricks. The, um, there, by the time World War II broke out, there were only six cannon left at the fort. They had all been mounted on uh, concrete platforms as called martial ornaments. There were two flanking the front door of the fort. Uh, there were four uh, on the outside walls. They were there, just there for people to enjoy. And uh, they were all hauled away for scrap, 1943. Uh, these were the last guns, end of an era. Uh, 
1950s, 1960s. Uh, the fort's empty. It's open for special tours, special events. And it, it became popular as uh, for making movies, of all things. Uh, one of the first movies made at Fort Point was something called Dark Passage with Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Uh, it was actually filmed outside the walls of the fort. Then there was one called A Man Who Cheated Himself in 1950. Uh, Point Blank in 1967. This is a still from the movie Point Blank, where they, you know, no CGI in, in those days. They actually landed the smallest helicopter they could get their hands on. They landed it in the parade ground at Fort Point. Uh, even today, w watching the movie, it's it's chilling to watch uh, a uh, helicopter come over the walls of the fort and lower itself down, and then a money exchange is made, and then it takes off again. Reportedly, the pilot said, I hope you got that, because no one's doing that again. Most famous movie made at Fort Point? Got to be, what is this one, Nicole? Vertigo. Vertigo, yes. Uh, where uh, Kim Novak uh, drives down to the fort, followed by Jimmy Stewart, and she throws a few flowers into the water, and then she jumps over the seawall. And the most common question we, we had when I was working at Fort Point was, where did she jump? And in reality, what happened was there was a, a platform built just below the level of the seawall so that when she, I think it was her, it might have been a stunt woman, made the jump. Her head just cleared the seawall, but she didn't actually end up in the water. Uh, and then Jimmy Stewart runs down a non-existent flight of stairs and uh, pulls her out of the water. That all takes place in a wave tank, probably somewhere in Hollywood. But he does bring her back up and uh, takes her back to the world's coolest apartment that he lives in on, on Russian Hill. Uh, it's it's iconic and, and deceiving. It, it's the magic of Hollywood. S By the 1950s, a group called the Fort Point Museum Association, made up of a lot of military uh, uh, personnel, they really stepped up with a Save the Fort movement. They got permission from the Department of Defense to take a permit to open the fort to the public and begin restoration and preservation and raise funds to restore it. Now, the thinking was, at that time, if it didn't relate to the Civil War, it didn't belong in the fort. And the Fort Point Museum Association, who would uh, manage the fort until 1970, they did a lot of stuff as a historic preservationist. I, I kind of quiver at now. There were additions that had been made to the fort uh, at the turn of the century and during World War II that were uh, uh, ripped off without documentation because they weren't part of the Civil War. Finally, in uh, 1970, Congress, led by the, the in, indomitable powerhouse of uh, Representative Phil Burton, got a bill through Congress to create a Fort Point National Historic Site. Here's a Phil and some, some of the folks from the Fort Point Association inspecting the fort, how it looked in 1969. A few temporary partitions, a lot of broken windows, a lot of rust. October 17, 1970, Fort Point National Historic Site is uh, uh, created. And one of the first things that happened is they, they bring rangers in. I love this photo. The, uh, this was like the low, the, the low ebb of women's uniforms in the National Park Service. Um, the ranger, uh, he trained me. His name was uh, Charlie Hawkins. He was a retired Army Master Sergeant, a veteran of the Battle of the Bulge. He uh, had worked for the Sixth Army as public information office, and he gave me a tour of Fort Point when I was in high school. Uh, later, he became the first employee of the uh, Fort Point National Historic Site. He was called the Chief Ranger. He trained us, and he had a love for that site. He was extremely professional, and uh, he worked us. Uh, we, were, we were his command. Uh, a bunch of us began serving as volunteers in parks 
1971. He really liked guys with beards because they looked the part. Um, I couldn't raise a beard with fertilizer, but he, he let me wear the Civil War uniform anyway. John, just real quick, was that the last time you ever wore um, a historic outfit? I wore a historic outfit uh, for a living history program we did as a staff training in the mid 1970s. But no, I don't. I don't. I don't do living history. I, I figure. I also too. I was never in. I don't have the right to wear the uniform. But we taught kids. One of our most popular things was school groups. Uh, Four Point is the perfect place to talk about California history because you have everything from the Spanish colonial to uh, the Civil War to World War II. We taught kids how to uh, load and fire without real ammunition, a Civil War cannon, sort of as a little team building activity. We uh, also uh, turned some of the rooms into museums and exhibit spaces. We held seminars. In this case here, this is actually, this is uh, relatively recent. This is um, uh, Rangers, uh, Steve Haller and Guy Washington doing a training on uh, California and the Underground Railroad. Restoration. The fort needed a lot of help. Uh, that old expression, rust never sleeps. It can't be more true than at Fort Point, which is, yeah, literally, it's on the Pacific Ocean. When you had 400 soldiers assigned there whose uh, job was nothing to do except to train on the artillery and then load and uh, rather scrape and paint, the fort in the 1860s was in pristine condition. By 1868, it was already turning ruinous, rust. Extensive amounts of ironwork had to be replaced. First thing was the lighthouse. It was totally disassembled taken down to its bare skeleton, new sheet metal uh, reproduced using the original drawings, and it was returned to the way it looked, uh, correct with the, the paint scheme, to, the, to the, its last appearance in the 1930s. And in this photo here, taken only a couple of years ago, you can see rust never sleeps. It's back again. To my memory, the Fort Point Lighthouse has been restored at least, uh, restored at least three times. Other things that were done, the ornate railings that enclosed all the openings of all the casemates and lined all of the porches, those were all replaced at great cost. They, they weren't a, a simple casting. Interior rooms were turned into uh, interpretive sites, theaters, a classic museum, with different types of ammunition, different types of bullets. It was decided that the uh, guideline for restoring Fort Point would be to restore it, or maybe the better term is rehabilitation. Restore connotates everything is perfect, exactly what it was, down to the slightest minutia at a certain point in time. We're not going there. But we are rehabilitating the fort to represent how it looked during its most important historic period, which was completion in 1861 to the beginning of the rehabilitation uh, as a disciplinary barracks in 1914, when some really sizable alterations were made. Historic cannon were brought in, cannonballs, uh, replica equipment, like that crazy looking thing in the foreground, that's called a garrison gin. It's a portable tripod with lifting gear. That's how you lifted the cannon move them around inside the fort. Interior rooms. You, rather than just going in willy-nilly, a historic furnishings report was created where a professional historian, a uh, good friend of mine, she went through copious boxes of documentation about the fort, looking for gleaning little things like reference to uh, this, uh, the, the post-surgeon had uh, 10 gallons of uh, medicinal brandy on hand that they kept in, in the pantry. Scant information was turned up about inside the fort, but remember there were 40 other forts of this design, many of which were well-documented, even like in period newspapers. 
like these views of, of uh, officer's quarters inside Fort Sumter, um, curtains, fireplaces, uh, rugs on the floor. Using those as a guideline, we've begun to rehabilitate and restore some of the interior rooms of Fort Point. This can be an ongoing project as more information comes to light about the fort and its occupants. Some things that we've learned about the fort as time went by, graffiti carved into wet cement by a guy with his finger, number 7710 was a convict on Alcatraz. And he probably was there in 1914 helping with the conversion of the old fort into the never finished disciplinary barracks. A soldier by the name of Hazlitt from the 67th Company of Coast Artillery, 1913, carved his name into the granite on the barbette tier. Somebody in row from the camouflage detachment of the Harbor Defenses of San Francisco, 1943 to 1945. My favorite, this happened when we started to strip old paint. We uncovered this hand-drawn uh, portrait of an anonymous woman inside the walls of one of the uh, prison cells on the first tier of the fort. It's got to be 1860s. And uh, there it was, she's, she's our, our, our mystery woman. A lot of areas of the fort, we just, we let them speak for themselves. There's no reason to say gild the lily. It, one of the fort's attractions is its uniformity, its anonymity. Uh, what went on here? What happened here? The famous spiral staircases of Fort Point, which are actually the source of, um, of ranger lore that I'm trying to stamp out. Somebody once upon a time started saying that these stairs, they circle to the left as you walk up so that any soldier trying to fight his way to the top during an attack, he wouldn't be able to swing his sword because most of them are right-handed. Well, I visited other forts and the stairs go just the opposite direction. It's um, no, stop saying that. Fort Point is considered to be the best preserved of third system forts in the United States. Hard to believe with the Golden Gate Bridge springing over it, but virtually all the other third system forts, they've had terrible things happen to them. Uh, many cases, battle damage, like Fort Sumter. Um, Fort Pulaski has been uh, rescued uh, from the the savannah, um, the, the wetlands. Other forts were partly demolished at the turn of the century to build new concrete fortifications within their walls. Fort Point, aside from the 1914 alterations, is incredibly intact. And according to the, as, as you can imagine, there is a world of wonks who study these forts. This is the best. Work still continues. Um, we have surprises uh, that, that even today uh, get our attention. For example, uh, recently a photo turned up on eBay taken from this position. This is the earliest photo we have of soldiers inside the fort, 1907. A bunch of guys um, think they're having a game of stickball. Things like this, again, can bring life back to a vacant uh, position. And no, I wasn't able to buy the postcard. It went for something like $110. I have my limits. 1913, uh, 2013, they were building a new trail near the Golden Gate Bridge, the coastal trail, and they uh, stumbled upon this. And they called me and uh, Steve Howler, my buddy, and he was the parks historian. And it didn't take us any time to realize this was what was left of a gun platform for one of those uh, 1870s gun batteries. Used to mount a pair of uh, heavy 15 inch Rodman guns. In the 1890s, the guns were dismounted and the gun positions just buried in place. There's still a lot to be learned about the fort. In 2018, a rifled projectile looking very much like a modern bomb was discovered in the Marin Headlands lying in the weeds near Point Diablo. Uh, they called an Air Force Explosives Ordnance de uh, Demolition Crew to come out to see if it was live and 
It was damaged and they uh, identified it incorrectly as a World War II US Navy artillery shell. Um, it wasn't, it was an eight inch artillery projectile that had been fired from Fort Point from one of the, uh, the cannon. I remember that photograph of them shooting at the Marin Headlands? This is what they were firing. Um, but EOD, you know, they do what they got to do. They didn't know if it was live or not, so they, they blew it up. Um, it wasn't live. Archaeological excavations at the fort. The top of the fort, the uh, terraplane where the guns were mounted uh, on the big turntables, originally it was um, turf up there. It was grass and earth, partly to absorb bombardment. Well, in the 1914 redo, it would have uh, been covered with concrete. That area intrigued the historians. So they did a test hole, went down through a couple of inches of concrete. They hit a manhole and looking down in the manhole with a camera, we knew the plan said it should be there and there it was. It was a catchment system. Water landing on the grass on the terraplane would filter down be caught in these underground conduits and the water would be led by a series of pipes inside the fort's walls to underground water cisterns. Still there. Things are going on at the fort. If you get a chance, go back. You're gonna see new things in operation uh, and new activities all the time. New exhibits going in. Uh, here, a uh, replica soldier with a replica rifle defending the sally port through the rifle slits. Scaffolding going up in the background. They're, they're rebuilding the iron staircases. But it's about time. The last time they were rehabilitated was about 50 years ago. Education programs for kids is a really dedicated group of uh, rangers, interpreters down there. We like to bring kids in. We like to uh, tell them the stories of the people in the, of the fort and a little hands-on activity. And if nothing else, as a kid, just go into the fort. It's just a blast. There's endless corridors. There's staircases to run up and down. There's, there's a lighthouse. There's cannons you can stick your face into. Um, I, I love the place. I love to see that it, it, how far it's come since I started 52 years ago there as a volunteer. And as a heads up, we're gonna have a special event a week from Saturday. We're going to have uh, Living History Days at Fort Point. Happens once a year. And we get reenactors come back from all over California to uh, garrison the fort. There's going to be exhibits of uh, Civil War cooking. They're going to be doing drills. They're going to be showing how a cannon was fired. Can't really fire one though. There's going to be a really chilling display on Civil War uh, medicine and how that was called out. So that's, it's going to be free from uh, 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. on sun, uh, Saturday, August 12th. I'll be there leading tours and uh, signing books. Okay, Whew. that was a lot. Um, again, Fort Point, it's it, almost lost in the shadow of the Golden Gate Bridge, but it's part of the warp and woof of San Francisco. It sure has been part of mine. If you haven't been there, go. You got I me, mean, you got to take your out of town visitors there. And if nothing else, you know, look for where Jimmy Stewart ran down to get. Dripping wet Kim, Kim Novak, an iconic moment in uh, film history. And I thank you. I'm going to turn it back to you uh, if, if there are any more questions. Thank you so much, John. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we actually have someone here, Matt. I want, to, I want to, a special call out to Matt because he's with the um, Friends of Civil War Alcatraz and he'll be with you on August 12th, bringing the, the fort to life. Right. So, and Matt's been like very on top of, of all of it <laughs> all evening. So shout out to Matt. I do have um, one question, John. Yeah. I want to know more about the lighthouse keepers houses that were near the fort. Like what, who were these people? What did they do? What, what was their life like? There was a, a lighthouse outside the walls of Fort Point, even while it was being constructed. Um, Lighthouse keepers were civilian employees of the uh, lighthouse board and 
Fort Point had uh, two different lighthouses over the years because it was not just a light uh, glowing in a tower, but additionally they had uh, clockwork activated fog bells and later on steam powered uh, fog horns. There were at, at the height, three different families living at Fort Point. They didn't live in the fort, they lived in houses immediately outside the walls of the fort. And they actually, they had a, a bridge that ran from the bluff uh, behind the fort where their houses were onto the, the top of the fort. So they didn't have to go all the way down and then all the, the spiral staircases. Uh, their life was pretty good. Um, they had plenty of company. There were plenty of soldiers. There were plenty of sightseers on weekends. Uh, uh, we've interviewed, uh, they're probably all passed away now. Some of the lighthouse keepers families, they loved living there. The downside was that um, when the Golden Gate Bridge was built, all of a sudden you had this thing looming over your house that actually moved the houses. And it was decided uh, about the time the bridge was um, almost nearing completion just to shut the lighthouse down. Uh, this, its light beam was gonna be blocked by, by the, the bridge. And uh, there, so the lighthouse families moved out and the army tried to get non-commissioned officers and their families to live in the house. And now, now this is hearsay from Charlie Hawkins, but he would know that they couldn't get anyone to stay there very long because of the constant noise. People were dropping things off the bridge. Uh, you know, you don't want your kid playing out in the backyard and having, you know, a, a penny, you know, land on the top of their head. So they let the buildings lasted until about 1961 and then they were torn down. Yeah, would have made a perfect administrative headquarters. And I was so excited to see that you brought up Albert Sidney Johnson, although you kind of can't not bring up Albert Sidney Johnson when you're talking about the Civil War in the Fort era. But um, I don't know if I showed you, I think I may have. When I was working for the Park Archives and Records Center, I actually cataloged pieces of Johnson's um, uniform from civil, the Civil War. And yes. he died at the Battle of Shiloh. Um, mm -hmm. so folks who uh, weren't in the room with John and I, he died at the Battle of Shiloh, but he, if I remember correctly, please correct me, John, if I'm wrong, he was shot and, but he didn't die immediately. And so as the story goes, he sort of like backed himself up against a tree and used a handkerchief to like cut off, you know, like um, stem the blood flow to the appendage that had been hit by the bullet. And he ended up bleeding out and his family kept the uniform, this blood-stained Confederate uniform for years and years and years, and ended up donating it to the Fort Point Army Museum slash Presidio Army Museum that they helped support for many years. And they had torn it up at a certain point to use for rags to, you know, clean the house or do whatever with, but whatever they had left, they donated. And these were, I mean, opening a box of like, you know, unmarked, completely unknown contents and pulling out bloody pieces of like Confederate uniforms was um, pretty wild. And I remember you came into research randomly and I was like, oh my God, John, come here. <laughs> you need to see these immediately. This is wild. Oh yes, was, th th that was on display in the fort for a while. And I thought that was like one of the grotiest things I'd ever seen. <laughs> So I guess I guess other parts of his um, uniform went other places. So. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I mean, it's like it's so interesting to to be able to. I mean, for me personally, to like touch something that connected to the Civil War, but at the same time, like I don't know, I don't know that we should have relics like that available for consumption. But um, John, we do have a, a, a question from Matt. He said, "Why is there a lack of photos of Fort Point during World War II?" I don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. The, the there are some batteries in the old harbor defenses of San Francisco where there are oodles of photos, like Battery Chamberlain. We have dozens. Uh, I speculate it was one that the press was taken to, you know, to mm. let them get some photos. Uh, a lot of photos were taken um, at uh, uh, what was the battery uh, battery. Rep on McKindo and then we're in Headlands. Some there are no photographs of there are no photographs of, of uh, Battery um, Chester at, at Fort Miley. There likely were prohibitions against bringing your own camera in. Uh, 
And the uh, few photos that uh, do survive, although I'll caught us of that. I knew a guy who was there as a ROTC who sneaked his camera in and took all kinds of pictures in <laughs> 1940. Um, lucky he didn't get court-martialed or whatever ROTC version is. Uh, the, that one photo that we have of the soldier at Fort Point very likely was a press photo. It came from the public library's collection. So maybe they'll turn up someday. We, we never say never. Yeah, everyone check your basements right now. <laughs> I mean, some of my favorite photographs of Fort Point is by Edward Moybridge. I mean, his, I mean, I'm into Moybridge in general. Um, see our podcast episode about it. But, um, but yeah, they're, they're just like, would they give photographers like that access to the fort or was he just kind of going around on his own? Moybridge called himself the official uh, U.S. government photographer for the Pacific Coast. I spent a couple of weeks in the National Archives looking for any authorization that he had. He seems to have talked his way into an expedition in Alaska about 1867. And in return for taking pictures he'd give to the government, they you know, gave him passage. Knowing, knowing him now the way I do for my reading, he made up the title and simply called himself that. And uh, the, the army might, might have easily said, yeah, sure, we know you. Go ahead. Uh, the pictures that he took at Fort Point were all taken uh, during the brief period after the garrison left and uh, another group of soldiers moved in. The, in that, that series, you, you probably know the series, there's one picture of a guy wearing a hat that we thought was a soldier. Oh, yeah. We think it's Moybridge. He frequently put himself in, in his own photos. Yep. It's, it's not really a uniform. It's a it's a, you know, he's got a short jacket on and a pillbox hat. So, so uh, yeah, and he parlayed that. He took all kinds of pictures of military sites, uh, Fort Point, Alcatraz, uh, Fort Mason. So, um, yeah, but the, uh, the reason those exist is because Muybridge sold them. They were reproduced all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, please read books on, on Muybridge. He is a fascinating, scandalous photographer. <laughs> Really, San Francisco. Don't <laughs> build his wife's uh, boyfriend, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, acquitted by a jury who was like, ah, I would have murdered that guy too. Yeah, that sounds good. Hey, I see somebody had a question about said shot ovens were still there that late. The uh, shot ovens uh, that showed up in a couple of those photos, those were there until 1914. Again, that, that, that's why that's a dark period in the fort's history. So much original Civil War fabric was lost. I mean, can we rebuild that? Can like some of the rangers build hot shots and like fire them into the Pacific Ocean for fun? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think the rangers could rebuild it, but yeah, there are plans. Um, I, I've seen a couple of rebuilt uh, hot shot furnaces at other forts. Um, the, the Army had standard plans for everything. There's even one fort on the East Coast where they fire one of those giant Civil War cannon like that were on the roof of the fort. Yes, makes a makes a lot of noise. <laughs> Matt also has another question: Were the army soldiers that were on Alcatraz during World War II in contact with the soldiers at Fort Point, and did they have a telephone or communication system between them? They had totally different missions. The guys that were on uh, Alcatraz during the uh, World War II, they were anti-aircraft artillery, mm -hmm. and they were concerned with uh, tracking shooting down, if necessary, aircraft. The guys at Fort Point were anti-motor uh, torpedo boat, uh, water surface targets. The only communication they would have had would have been through some extreme high uh, level uh, central command, uh, information command, where information was shared in time of battle, but on a need to know basis. But you know, it isn't like they were going, hey, I think we've got a torpedo boat over here. Can, I, uh, can you shoot some, uh, no. Didn't, didn't work that way. So um, now's your time to ask the questions that you've been dying to ask John Martini when you have him in the Zoom room. While you think about maybe any last lingering questions, I'm gonna promote his upcoming walk. We're doing a Fort Mason history walk um, on a date. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but if you go to Eventbrite, John's pointing to his phone. <laughs> 
And um, I highly recommend like Fort Fort Mason is beautiful and, and an incredible special place here in San Francisco. And John gives the best tour ever. So I highly recommend you go to our event right and look for that. September 9th. There it is. And we September. do have another question from Brian, John. Mm -hmm asking do we know if the soldiers in the late 1800s and early 1900s were given leave to enjoy the entertainment offerings of the city proper if so was that one of the reasons for the jail rooms <laughs> <laughs> yes and yes uh, it, as best we can determine when you were assigned to fort point remember the barracks buildings was down near the warming hut there were boundaries to the post and you weren't supposed to leave the boundaries of the post unless you had leave. And there are lots of newspaper articles about soldiers wandering over to the Barbary coast and uh, getting mugged, or sometimes they'd sell, they'd sell their, uh, their heavy wool jackets to buy a drink. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. And if you were to come back and you were to be you know, drunk or disorderly or try to go AWOL, you'd probably be, you know, in one of the jail cells for a while. Military punishment was that you had what was called company punishment for relatively small infractions, fighting, drunk, I don't know, insulting the sergeant. They'd keep you at the fort and uh, lock you up and probably take you out and give you really nasty jobs during the day, like cleaning out the, st the stables, cleaning out the latrines. If you were a real screw up and did something serious, they sent you to Alcatraz. Alcatraz was the long-term army prison, even in the 1880s and 90s. So Chelsea has corrected us to say that the Fort Mason history walk is August 26th. <laughs> what? <laughs> we'll work our calendars out later, later John. And um, our board president, Arnold Woods, is telling me to wrap it up. So <laughs> I think it's time. You're right, for it is. A, I'm doing Fort Miley on uh, <laughs> in September. Never mind. John's very in demand. Um, My bad. My bad. <laughs> you go to his own website too to see what he's up to. Thank you so much for everybody who joined us for this evening. If you have any questions, please email us. Um, my email is nicole at outsidelands.org, and I'm happy to pass along any further questions to John. And John, thank you so much. This was another wonderful evening about history on the West Side. Thank you, guys. We're going to say good night now and let you all go about your evenings. Thank you for being with us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Apologize, Arnold. <laughs> Apologize, Arnold.